Hey everybody, and welcome to Unit 1, Module 1, Assessment 2, Labs. Get out of here, mouse. So you remember last time we talked about anthropometrics, that was the A. Now we're at B, the biochemical analysis of labs. Of labs? No, biochemical analysis, aka labs. There we go. Let's do a quick review here. Labs serve as markers of metabolic function. They're measuring things and showing us things that we can't see ourselves. Just like anthropometrics, trending is more important than immediate readings. So that trend line is more important than one data point. I'd argue that's true all the time. It's especially true in geriatrics. And a vocabulary reminder here as well. Uh, a positive acute phase protein increases during an acute stress event. Negative acute phase protein decreases during an acute, bleh, acute stress event. So again, because I messed it up, positive acute phase increases during acute stress, negative acute phase decreases during acute stress. Uh, you know, an interesting point, I think, uh, is uh, to discuss is where do labs come from? Because this isn't something I actually like thought about ever until I started working in gerontology. It just had never come up to me before. Uh, so where do they come from? Normal lab ranges come from cohorts that are tw about 20 to 40 years old of healthy adults. Uh, and the discerning listener will note a couple of problems as this relates to gerontology immediately. Uh, one problem, sort of, is that it's uh, plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean which means it covers 95% of the population. That's, and that's fine. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, a 95% confidence interval is pretty standard. We, we accept that 5% outside of norm risk on, on almost everything. The more uh, impactful for gerontology issues are that one, all the participants, or at least most of them are healthy, uh, which it's probably fine because you want those healthy people without any issues so we can get a good, solid idea of what normal looks like. It's an issue for gerontology because if you remember, almost everybody has, almost everybody that's a geriatric patient has one or two or more uh, chronic conditions. It's just a fact of getting older. So already our, the cohort we have to pull data from does not resemble our patient base. Also, uh, all of our patient base is um, has aged out of the cohort. Right? Most of the people in the cohort from the labs are like half the age of our, our our patient base, or more. I'm sorry, or less, less than half. So there's there's a distinct question as to how reflective of ger geriatric patients labs actually are. Hello, boo, I'm up here. Uh, everyone take a second, take a few deep breaths. We'll go back to normal here in a minute. Nausea will pass, okay? I wanted to discuss the malnutrition diagnostic tool. If you have not ever seen this before, this is a tool created by the AND and Aspen to help with diagnosing malnutrition. Uh, know here that the first nutrition risk identifier is either compromised intake or loss of body mass. That that's the trigger for this. Uh, the second question is is inflammation present, and that is the only lab question we're going to get out of this. Okay, the only thing it asks is is inflammation present, and I guess the, you could argue secondarily it argues to what degree, but that's all it cares about. Uh, on the one hand, on one end of this is no, there's no. Uh, inflammation present, in which case it's just classic starvation. On the other hand, there's um, up to, yes, we're very inflamed. That's acute, acute disease or injury related. This is you know, a, a broken long bone, a severe burn, a very bad infection. So that's the only laboratory criteria that they, they recommend. I'm back down here now. Hi. All right. So Lab rules. There's really one hard and fast rule I want to get across here, which is there are no labs that can diagnose PCM. Okay? None. Do not come 
later on when we do assessments and PES statements, do not come with albumin or prealbumin. There are no labs that can diagnose malnutrition. Now you can go in and you can diagnose micronutrient deficiencies with labs. That works. You know, you could say, well, their B12 level is very low, so they have B12 deficiency. That's fine. You just can't do PCM macronutrient level deficiencies. The other things to bear in mind are uh, don't stick a patient if you don't have to. You know, if you can pull this data from somewhere else, do it. Don't, don't come by and stab them again. There's no need. Also, if it won't change your mind, don't order it. Uh, if you're looking for affirmation, if you're looking for some support on an idea, that might be fine. But if, you, if a positive or negative value, one way or the other, won't sway your initial decision on this, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't go taking more labs than you need to, okay? All right, so as we go forward here, keep in mind, this lecture does not cover all labs. There's no way. <laughs> There's no way. This is only uh, specifically relevant to geriatrics and how those lab values differ from the average adult. The first most important thing, in, the first most important thing, Y'all, uh, English is not my friend tonight. Uh, the important, the first thing to note is that higher age is uh, equals higher variability when you're talking about labs. Uh, there's a lot less homogeneity in uh, labs for geriatric patients than there is in the average adult population as a whole. Uh, normal ranges uh, shift on some labs, or they're exaggerated, so they expand one way or both. Uh, there's also uh, more variation between patients and within one patient. So it means as a, at a population level, there can be a lot more variation than you'd expect from an adult sample size. There's also a lot more variation possible within one patient. You know, those, that, those highs and lows can swing a lot more from one visit to the next. So why, right? Um, most of it's due to the the changes we talked about before in composition and function. Uh, we know for a fact that there are changes that happen as a body gets older, and we don't just mean gray hair, although that. Uh, there are known physical alterations. Uh, decreased lean body mass occurs as one ages, as well as increased uh, adiposity. You can, you can tell from our model up here that decreased lean body mass is a severe problem in older people. As I said earlier, this does happen. This is a trend. You can fight this. You you personally, for you, can fight these changes, uh, as, as he clearly has done. Also, functionality decreases. Uh, for example, decreased cardiac output, decreased renal function. We anticipate this as people get older. Again, to a degree, this is something that you can combat for yourself. This is not a like a doomsday scenario that you're, there's no escaping. You can. Uh, it does take some work, right? The natural state of things is for this slow shift to occur. So do lab values change with age? Some definitely do. We know for a fact that sex hormones, say, decrease. Estrogen and testosterone decrease as you age. Cholesterol increases as you age. There is some good evidence that albumin, triglycerides, and creatinine BUN change as you age. Um, given all of that, there has been some argument that we should create a gerontology lab panel. In the same way that there's a pediatric lab panel, there has been a suggestion that there, there, be, a wor there be work done towards creating a gerontology lab panel. Um... And there are some proposed ones out there. I have, here's a, there's a web, no, take it, keep it wrong. There's an address for you. I obviously can't give you a hyperlink in a video. Um, now, it's important to note that uh, these have not been validated. So do they work? Um, you know, are, are they, are they valuable? Hard to say. Uh, it's also unclear how much diagnostic value they actually have. Again, Given that there's so much variation in a population of gerontological patients, and given that there will be some people with chronic conditions, it's not clear to what degree this would benefit. 
Yeah, let's talk about a couple here. I mentioned albumin. I know albumin has come up before, and we're going to go over how it affects gerontology. Okay, so background, refresh here. Uh, albumin is a carrier protein. It's the carrier protein, actually. It's a negative acute phase protein. Remember, that means during a stress event, albumin decreases. It is an excellent marker of morbidity. Uh, so if you want to know how sick somebody is, an albumin level, a low albumin level is very indicative of a high level of morbidity. So they're sick. It's also a pretty good marker of mortality, or at least a predictor of mortality. The lower an albumin, the greater risk somebody is of dying. It's a very poor nutrition marker, though. Um, I know it has been introduced in the past to you as a marker, as something to check for. It has so many masks. And if you look in a textbook, even, about albumin and see what the masks are, the ones they always list are hydration status, stress and or inflammation, and age. It will always list age. And I, so already for gerontology, <laughs> we're, we're a little bit behind eight ball there. In a geriatrics, I will say, even given all this, this is the most likely reason you will get a consult for malnutrition in a geriatric patient. Uh, they, they hand those out like candy. Um, the normal range for albumin is 3.5 to 5. I personally do not get excited in a geriatric patient if they have an albumin above 3. Uh, I just, I've seen it so often. It's, it's not even worth mentioning particularly. There is evidence that albumin negatively correlates to age, so we would anticipate that. As somebody gets older, albumin decreases at, at, at a normal rate. Um, it's also uh, true that albumin, um, I'm sorry, supplementation for albumin is generally non-impactful nutritionally. And I mean that both ways. Giving somebody, say, more protein and calories, not beneficial to increasing their albumin, Giving albumin does not increase nutritional markers. It can be used for fluid removal, but that really wouldn't be uh, your call anyway. So you know, if you see that happen, that's what they're doing. They're doing acute fluid removal, but it doesn't work in any other way. Transtheratin is one that will also come up for you. Uh, well, Transtheratin is also pre-albumin. Uh, Worth noting also is that the reason it got the name prealbumin, that seems to indicate that it ties to albumin in some way, and it doesn't. Uh, the reason it has the name prealbumin is because it completed its electrophoresis run before albumin did. It, it's faster than albumin. It transports thyroxine. It's uh, similar, it has similar di nutritional diagnostic value to albumin. And the reason for that is its masks are the same. Uh, stress, trauma, inflammation, all of those can reduce transtheritin. It does seem to be a little bit more, um, what is working for here? It seems that hydration status affects transtheritin a little bit less than albumin. A shorter half-life also can make it a slightly better indicator of nutritional intervention. And I'm hedging that with slightly because I am not convinced myself personally, based on what I have seen and what I have on the work I have done, but I'm not going to like outright shoot it down. It is definitely, it is more indicative of how people are, how a patient is doing in uh, the immediate term since it has such a sh uh, shorter half-life. Okay, so this is the big one. This is, remember, going back to the, the malnutrition diagnostic tool, this is the actual question that, um, and an aspen asked, are they inflamed? So this would be, this is specifically they're looking at the CRP is really what they're asking. I know there are other markers for inflammation than that, but that's the one that they're actually looking at. So but CRP is a positive acute phase protein. It increases in times of stress or inflammation is kind of the cause of inflammation. As long as CRP is high, albumin will be low. Okay, and there is nothing that you can do or anyone else can do to change that. As long as a person is inflamed, their albumin will be low. Um, and it may not actually be diagnostic at all. Okay, really quickly, let's talk about renal function here. 
as I mentioned earlier, that this is some, one that we're kind of eh, about. Uh, so, a serum BUN and creatinine may not be an accurate assessment of renal function in an older adult. Uh, we are pretty sure that creatinine clearance decreases by about 10 that uh, per decade. That That's a rule of thumb, right? 10, 10 per decade. Um, the concern here, or, or the thought experiment, we have, there's not really been a way to test this yet, is that as because we're all we're expecting both renal function to decrease but also lean body mass to decrease remember that creatinine is a waste product of lean body mass and it's just one that happens by being alive with lean body mass the concern or the argument is that as lean body mass decreases the amount of creatinine in the blood decreases so it looks Normal. It looks like kidney function is normal when it may not be. The kidneys are slower, but also there's less waste to move out. The best yardstick for renal function is uh, still the cre standing creatinine clearance test, but you're very unlikely to see that um, because it's a 24-hour test. It has to be done either in facility or in somebody's home in which they have to store urine, keep it chilled, bring it back to the lab. It's a very difficult lab to do. It's not one that will be done unless there's real concern that someone has kidney disease. And very quickly, let's talk about the EGFR. Uh, EGFR is a derived value, and that's partially why this matters. Many, many gerontology patients will have signs of kidney disease by like laboratory markers of kidney disease. Some of that may be really related to that creatinine function. Remember, the creatinine is, if you look at the lab values here, this way, if you look at the lab values here, you see creatinine is one of the labs to calculate from. It may be off, remember? Also, remember that D, uh, EGFR, I'm sorry, that creatinine clearance draw, decreases per decade. I'm, I'm really struggling with words. So... EGFR may not be a fantastic marker for the elderly patient. I'm not saying that we should discard it. I'm just saying bear that in mind as you look at somebody. Look also for physical markers of disease. And that is a wrap, y'all. So just to keep in mind here, lab values vary as patients age, both population-wise and individually. Trends are more important than individual data points, and you can't diagnose malnutrition from labs. All right, and I mean that. Do not bring that. All right, I will catch you all next time when we will talk about signs and symptoms. Have a great day.